Thanks a million, Olivia. Uh, my name is Sinead and I'm the Chief Executive of Education Support, which is the UK charity for the mental health and well-being of everyone working in education. Uh, and I'm delighted to welcome my colleague Pep Diasio, who is head teacher of a secondary school, also recently ASCAL president and currently the nominated next general secretary for ASCAL. Uh, which, uh, as you will know, represents uh, head teachers across the UK. Um, Pepe is going to, well, I'm going to do a quick slideshow and talk to you about something called the Teacher Retention Commission, which we ran earlier this year. Uh, I'll not dwell on the details of it, but I'll try and pull out some of the, the most interesting points for you as governors. Uh, and actually, I'm going to ask Pepe for his reflections as a serving head on what comes out of this that he thinks is most important for governors to pay attention to. A lot of the recommendations from this work were focused on policymakers, um, but we want to talk to you today in your role as governors. And let me just, with that in mind, can I just say, as a primary governor, my school had the Ofsted call yesterday, so I am in uh, preparation for my stint in the hot seat tomorrow morning. Uh, so I know you will empathise with me uh, as, as I go through that. Um, uh, right, so share, hopefully you can see some slides. Uh, the Just want to land with you, we have a free counselling helpline that's available to anyone working in education. So if there's anyone in your school who is in difficulty, make sure your head teacher knows about this and the senior leadership team knows about this. It's 24-7 and available to everyone for free and confidential. Uh, the research I'm talking about is available at this link on the bottom of the slide, and we'll post that into the um, uh, chat at some point so that you can access it. But it's on the Education Support website, and it's this piece, 1970s Working Conditions in the 1920s, which is the final report of the Teacher Retention Commission. The commissioners on that piece of research were from these organisations, fantastic people who came together to take evidence from uh, experts, from teachers, from school leaders uh, across England. And although this is an English study, Education Support does a lot of work in Wales. And I know that a lot of the findings are relevant in the Welsh context as well. There might be some nuanced difference, but a lot of this stuff resonates across both England and Wales. And um, there's some, just to say, the research was done in partnership with Public First. There was some good polling done. There was a variety of research methods used. Um, but some of the big headlines that will be of interest to you, four out of five teachers love their jobs. That is still true. And it's very hard sometimes to hold that in mind when we look at some of the dismal retention figures that we see coming out. But the baseline is we still have people who love what they do in the education sector. That said, one in three will say that their work-life balance is poor or very poor. And this really matters because work-life balance is one we know from global research across all workplaces. Work-life balance, the ability to switch off, is one of the really important things that matters for personal well-being. And we know in education we have a kind of normalised, very high level of workload. And this is really problematic, keeps people awake at night, gets in the way of them having a private life, uh, which in turn means they don't rest, they don't recover, and they turn up in the classroom that bit less uh, able to do a great job than they would otherwise do if they were well rested, well recovered, and having a, a good balance in their life. Um, in direct response to the level of workload and this poor work-life balance, one in five teachers in this particular poll said they were uh, looking, they, they didn't imagine being in the profession. We've done other research on this where the findings are quite a lot higher of people uh, being preparing to leave the profession. Um, and we know, of course, that in England, 40,000 odd teachers left the profession last year for reasons other than retirement, which is means we're turning over the entire education profession in kind of 11, 12 years. It's extraordinary, the scale of, of departures, which speaks to a big problem. The DFE's own research tells us about the number of hours that people are working. Uh, the World Health Organization in 2021 came out and said that working more than 55 hours a week is a presents a significant uh, negative impact on people's health. Uh, it's related to uh, heart issues, to muscular skeletal issues, uh, to immune system issues, to a whole host of 
long-term chronic health conditions and life-threatening conditions, and it has a direct impact on mortality. So people who are routinely working more than 55 hours a week are significantly more likely to die younger than they otherwise would. That's the long and the short of it. And when we look at the average hours that people are working in education, it puts them squarely in this bucket of concern. Um, uh, so we talked to people about what might keep them in the profession. Certainly the type of work that people are doing, not just the hours matters. Nobody wants to sit there producing a data dump or marking. It is not speaking to what took them into teaching in the first place. And when you're trying to do all of that and still not having time for a personal life, it's unsurprising that four out of five teachers said that if they could improve that work-life balance and all else remained equal, they would shift out of the sector into a different job. So the attractiveness of the profession is under threat. The job is more than education now. We talk routinely to education staff who are dealing with significant social issues, emotional issues, mental health issues, families in distress, issues related to poverty, significant behavior, violence. There's a whole host of things. That's before we get to terrorism and gangs and everything else that schools are meant to cover. Um, this, the, the job has gone far beyond the lines of education. In terms of the retention commission, the key themes of the work were around pay and conditions and the appropriateness of that. Not surprising in a year in which we've seen industrial action and, and difficult industrial relations in the way we have. The point about work-life balance is very high on the list of everybody that we spoke to who was working in education currently. Pupil needs and behavior. Behavior has been problematic, but we had a lot of teachers also talk to us about what they see as a shift post-COVID in the behavior of their the, the children and young people they work with. And it speaks not just to, this isn't a question of poor behavior or bad behavior, but there's a sort of apathy and hopelessness that is emerging in the classroom where people and young people, even exam year students just don't appear to care that teachers correlate with what's happened over the last three years in terms of COVID and the cost of living crisis and all of that compounding difficulty has changed the social contract in some way between schools and families. And young people and children are not in good shape, I guess is the message that we heard. And, and nobody seems to, have an answer to how to tackle this or address it or even look at it more fully but it's a loud message that came out of our work and teachers pointed to that as something that caused them real concern there is no flexible working in a consistent way across the sector there are pockets of excellence and actually Pepe school is one of those um, where there are schools doing a great job at introducing flexible working, but the majority of schools still think that it is not possible in the education sector to do that well. So hopefully we can myth bust on that, Pepe, this morning. Um, the quality of professional learning matters enormously to education staff when it comes to what keeps them in the profession. If they can get really well-targeted, high-quality professional development, that's a big positive. And then the leadership and culture in a given school matters enormously, that staff feel respected, engaged with, that they have a voice, that they don't feel done to and treated like a cog in a machine. This matters enormously. The flexible working point, we've got 44% of teachers have some sort of formal arrangement, but a lot of this is around the way contracts are structured. There are There's a much smaller amount of people who feel they genuinely can uh, so organize a working contract around the sort of lifestyle and family commitments that they have. A lot of people who have children leave teaching because they don't feel they can parent well and teach well, for example. CPD, some numbers there around what people said mattered. So a third of people saying there's a significant lack at their school um, and people saying that they would want to change career to improve that. Part of this speaks to budgets and decisions that are being made in schools and not schools, not all schools are equally resourced. But by and large, we know that across the sector, we need to do something around professional development for people. There were a raft of recommendations in this report that speak to the system stuff that goes on in education. That included stuff like reviewing Ofsted, trying to mitigate the number of new policies coming out of DFE. The DFE doesn't have a formal retention target for staff and education. We think that needs to change. Um, there needs to be support for um, this whole issue around the complexity of what's facing children and young people. Is that owned 
around a family's agenda? Does it fit into schools? What about wider social care camps? How do we join this up? And how do we meaningfully engage with the legacy that we've been left and children and young people have been left with? Uh, and you can see if you paid attention to the report uh, last week about attendance, a lot of the same messages are echoed in that in terms of what's driving poor attendance rates across the country. Um, we also proposed sabbaticals every five years for school leaders. Uh, we'd like to see school leaders in the Caribbean with their feet up drinking pina coladas routinely. Uh, or failing that, we think that they could take some time out to review their own professional practice, to develop their leadership skills, to visit other schools around the country and learn good stuff. We think there's some great opportunities for professional development in the sector without needing to do anything else much fancier than that. Um, I'm going to try and stop sharing uh, my slides and invite Pepe in the first instance to offer reflections on any part of that Pepe that you think is particularly important here today. Uh, morning, everyone. Morning, Sinead. And what I would say is that I think head teachers have all welcomed uh, the feedback and, and the report because we see that it's targeted and aimed in the right areas. But we've got an audience today with us of uh, governors and much of what is targeted there is targeting on, on policy and, and on practice. And what I would ask more than anything here today is that governors understand the vital role that they play in both supporting and challenging the culture within a school. And uh, if I just reflect on uh, my own relationship with my governors at Wales, they are incredibly supportive, whilst at the same time being uh, challenging and wanting the very best for the young people of our school. So I think as governors, we probably all know our responsibilities around ensuring that we provide um, challenge and ensuring that our school is offering the very best support for young people. But what I would ask today really is to make sure that as governors, we are able to support the leadership of the school and make sure that we're able to help promote the effective support for the leaders of, of the school through a number of different ways. So just, just uh, to be very brief, first of all, I would ask how well you know the leadership of the school, how well you know the leaders and, and really get to grips with um, how they are finding their job and the challenges of their job. So you need really regular conversations with them so that you understand the culture that they're uh, with, the, the culture that they're enjoying in the school. So who do you talk to to understand that? How do you understand that you're getting a good reflection of that? You know, who 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 are you listening to to make sure that you are hearing a rounded view of the school and how the leadership of the school is uh, performing, but also how they're feeling as well. And, and are you getting any independent evaluation of that to triangulate how they are feeling too? Uh, and so that, that requires you to look at a range of data. I'm sure this, the, the, as a governor, you'll be aware of all the sorts of, of data that, that head teachers and, and school leaders can provide you. But what I would ask you is to, is to look as deep as possible into that data and have some really good conversations with the school leaders to make sure you understand how they are feeling and how they're coping with the responsibilities of the role right now. There's nothing more important to me as a head teacher than the conversations, uh, the, 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 the candor that I have with my chair of governors to let him know how I feel. We may well have a, a, have a conversation on, on results day in the summer about how results have gone, but there's also a follow-up conversation there about the impact of that on, on myself, and more importantly, on my wider team and how we make sure that the school remains healthy and well enough to take on the new challenges of the new term. And so if I was going to put anything into the into the discussion today, really, I would, I would ask how open and honest are you in supporting your school leadership? What what protocols have you got in place to enable that the head teacher is looking after themselves? Are you ensuring that they get the right sort of support be that through some of the the helplines that we've that Sinead has shared here today but also through encouraging coaching and coaching opportunities uh, through colleagues across the profession but also making sure i think that 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 they are well and they are they are promoting a positive culture across the school and so the thing that i'd want to challenge you with really is um, and this is one thing that I, I, I always discuss with my chair of governors, uh, how, can, how can you best understand that 
you love your school and that the head and the leaders of your school are, are aware of that, are passionate in the same way that you are for the wanting the best of the, the young people of the school. And how can you do that in a way that demonstrates that you care for them and their well-being too? Uh, and and that, that goes further than any policy uh, the policies to, that they are appropriate and they, and they do need to be well thought through and appropriate and challenging, but also supportive. But it's about that element of care and that, that, ele that element of building a relationship with both your school leader and the people around those school leaders to make sure that they know that you care for them and that you are in this together as a team in the best interest of the young people at the school. I hope I've made some sense there, Sinead. That, that's brilliant, Pepe. And I think one of the, I mean, I think this point about care really is at the heart of what governors want to be taking away and thinking about here. Um, the I think one of the things that when, when we talk to people who are in difficulty with their governing body, sometimes it's because governors are making significant demands on the leadership team to produce a lot of reports or policies or to uh, undertake additional work in preparation for Ofsted or whatever it might be. And I think that's the other place where the demonstration of care probably matters is for the governing group to question itself around what it's asking for, how realistic that is and what the impact will be. Because we all know, we, all of us will be familiar as governors with having asked for something because it would be interesting. Um, and I think we need to get past the interesting test to there is so much demand now on the school leadership. Is it essential? And if it's not essential, can we leave it? And is there going to be a terrible consequence of us, of us leaving it? So I think in that way, the operationalizing of that care, I think, sometimes happens through how we as governors relate to the school leadership around um, around workload. I, I wanted to ask you another point that is sort of tangential to this, but it's in the substance of, I think, culture and the support and the care. We have observed at Education Support, a lot of leaders flagging an increase in the last couple of years in difficult relationships with parents, but an increase in vexatious complaints in effect, which of course tend to wrap, the, you know, the governors will get, uh, will have a point of view on this and some governing bodies react with a kind of, oh my God, we've had this complaint and others are like, right, I know that this happens, so how do we do it? Is that something that you've seen and do you think there is something for governors to hold in mind when that sort of stuff happens in terms of this point about care and workload? Yeah, absolutely, Shed. Yes, we've seen a massive upturn in uh, complaints. I think uh, a phrase that I, I seem to be using more in the last three or four years is the evidence of, of keyboard warriors. Mm -hmm. There are, there are a number of parents that want to get off their concerns uh, via a, a social media app or, or a Facebook site or, or, or a wider breadth that can actually turn into quite a witch hunt quite, quite quickly. And, and head teachers need to know that, that governors have, have got their back, as it were, and have got their support. And, that, and for, that to, for that relationship to develop, there needs to be an ongoing dialogue where that trust is developed and... I, I think that it's important for governors to understand that, that often school leaders, head teachers can be their own worst enemy in either A, taking too much on, or B, not being completely honest about how they are feeling or some of the concerns that they're facing in the school. And that, that honesty will only be developed through a relationship of trust with their governors and developing that trust over time. And so I think it's important that for, you know, from this today, I would encourage as many governors as possible to invest in that trust, in that relationship, and, and give genuine time and care to making sure that the school leaders feel that they're able to share how they're feeling and share, share some of those challenges they're facing from parents in an open and supportive way. In, and, and the only way that they'll continue to do that is if they feel they can be supported by their governors and they can support one another. Yeah, yeah. Pepe, I'm going to come to you with a, a question from the uh, Q&A list on, on challenging culture. But before that, just to pick off another couple of the questions there, uh, Brony has asked about, should all governors be talking to leaders or can it be covered by the chair? My, my own experience on boards is you don't want all governors talking to, the, as lovely as that would be, yeah. uh, life is a bit too short for everybody. So the chair should be doing that. I think where it is good to have some additional cover is maybe if there's a link 
governor for well-being, they can additionally pick it up so that, and that can be helpful because sometimes the relationship between the chair and the head isn't great. Um, so that's maybe a way around that. Christine has asked, how often is a regular is regular um, for conversations? And I think, Pepe, tell me if you disagree, but I think that's really to be agreed between the chair and the leader, because I know some who speak every day and others who speak, you know, once a week or, you know, probably not a lot less frequently than that, but sometimes. Um, so I think it's about agreeing that working relationship and ways of working between you. Pepe, question from Ashley. And apologies, folks, that I'm rushing. I'm aware we've got the fantastic Steph Hamilton waiting to talk. I'm not wanting to overrun, and there's a lot to say. Um, but Pepe, when it comes to challenging the culture in a school, obviously that's not straightforward. If you're a governor and you have a, a sense the staff don't seem in great shape, you've maybe observed the school leader speaking in a clipped way or you, some policies come out and you're a bit concerned and you're concerned about the leadership and its impact and maybe that not being the leadership's awareness. That can be a difficult thing as a governor or even as a chair to raise. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I would suggest uh, in, a, in as positive a way as possible, you, you look to triangulate that because uh, as a head teacher, I don't want to be the only person reporting to my governors. And I would want my governors to have an independent view of, of what I'm saying as well. And I think governors should request an independent view of what that looks like. So, you know, in, in the good old days when it was always uh, sunshine and, and beautiful weather, we used to have school improvement partners and consultants that would support the school. And I, I would suggest that they are a good thing. If you can find someone who, again, you can develop a relationship with, who the head can, can perhaps uh, source and bring into the school, that will, that will provide you with an external voice, a neutral voice who can perhaps take on some of those issues that you are, are fearing or are sensing. And they, they can give you an opportunity to look more deeply into them and they'll either shine a light on them or perhaps they'll make you feel that they're, they're not as bad as you might, might think they are. But that triangulation, that independent voice uh, as a as a as a head, I would I would welcome that. I would want to be reassured that whatever I was thinking was somehow being sense checked by somebody else. And and if you are able to negotiate who that is with the head, so that you can get a sense of that too, uh, I, I would recommend that as a way forward. You know, fantastic. And I think uh, colleagues from Governors for Schools may well want to add other thoughts on questions there. But so we'll come back to that if you want to. And um, there's a question here around how can a chair encourage and then make sure that a head teacher is accessing support? Um, I, I think it's very I think one thing we have to be very cautious of, and I say this as an organization that makes, you know, that, that goes out into the world offering, you know, all sorts of support. You can lead a horse to water. We cannot force people to take support. I think what we can do, though, as governors is if if there is support available and let me say education support offers um, through a DFE funded program, professional supervision for school leaders across England. And indeed, we also have some spots in Wales for professional supervision, really high quality the, the impact review of this stuff's been super. So there's free currently at the moment. There is some free support out there. If your school leaders know it's there, but they're not taking it up, I don't think it's a question of, I, I think really you need to have a conversation with them about what might be the barriers to them taking that up or why they feel it's not appropriate for them or whether they'd be willing to experiment. I think there's a sort of engaging in some curiosity uh, probably that is a helpful step and in and of itself that conversation may actually be quite beneficial. Pepe, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. Yeah, I, I, I would suggest that uh, a, a, a good head teacher should be outward facing and should be wanting to talk about things with other people. And as a governor, I think you need to be asking if, if there are systems set up to enable the head teacher to do that, because where things go wrong is when people are not outward facing, they're not connecting with others and uh, they, they can easily become quite insular. And so uh, Sinead's right, you, you cannot take, you know, you can take the horse to water, but I would be regularly encouraging school leaders to talk to other people, be that through some of the systems we've got here, or perhaps a coaching model or, or, or an opportunity for them to have a network where they can just reflect on, on how things are going in the school. It's To me, that's just good practice and, it, and it's something we should be actively encouraging as governors. 
Thanks a million, Papi. There's some great questions here and I'm aware we're coming up to the end of our time, but I want to, so we won't get to them all, folks. I'm sorry about that. We'll try and, and add some um, into the chat as we go. But one I do want to pick up, Pepe, uh, is around flexible working. Can you say a little bit just about how you've managed to be such a brilliant poster boy for flexible working? Well, f first of all, um, it, it's tough within a school environment, let's just say that. But um, uh, what we've done is just really try to make sure that we support uh, and enable us to have the very best teachers in front of as many students for as much of the time as possible. And so what we've, you know, when I became a head teacher, uh, it was very much seen as a negative thing that uh, teachers worked part time or that or that uh, classes had to, had to see several different teachers throughout the week in different ways. And what I would say is that, that, that the world has changed massively in, in, the, in the last five years in particular, but definitely in the last three years. And I think what schools have got to do is adapt their processes and adapt their, their thinking so that we aim for the very best teachers and encourage the very best teachers to be in school. And to do that, you need to be prepared to be flexible and you need to be prepared to uh, look at creative solutions. Uh, you know, gone are the days when uh, young people wanted to work 24-7 uh, from seven in the morning to seven at the night, to seven at night. And that is, that is where many teachers start their careers and think, and that's one of the reasons why we're losing as many teachers as we are, you know, you, you know that. And so what we've got to do is make teaching as attractive as any other profession. And to do that, we need to make sure that we reward teachers, we incentivize them, but we also really look closely at their work, their work life balance and give them the opportunities to have the freedoms that are available in other professions right now. And, and to be clear, when we talk about this, yes, we are talking about part time, but we're also talking about job share. We're talking about condensed hours. Uh, we're talking about various arrangements that people make. Right. I'm. I'm talking about absolutely anything that will work for an individual. That, that sounds quite open ended, doesn't it? But, you know, if if a member of staff says to me, uh, I need to be at home every Wednesday to do X, Y and Z, then we build a timetable around that Wednesday. If if a member of staff, you know, I've got I've got a fantastic maths teacher who said, uh, I'm sorry, but I just I need to be able to drop my children off every morning. And that means that I just cannot be here before this time. We build yeah. a timetable around that yeah. member of staff to make sure that they 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 can run their life without having to fly around at a million miles an hour in the morning. But it, it, it can be as simple as that. Sorry, it can be as tricky as that, because I know that's not easy. Or it can be as simple as giving them a car park spot that enable them to get in and out of school 20 minutes quicker than perhaps they would do if they were searching for a car spot. So there's there's some really small things that we can do, Sinead, as well yeah. as big things. And to make that work, you basically need creative timetabling. You need leadership buy-in and support that it is possible. You need that optimistic outlook about everything being possible. And you need some kind of policy framework so that there is some equity between people, I guess. You need a clear policy. Is that fair? Yeah, and, and, and real transparency and openness between yourself. Uh, and, and that needs to be a part of the culture of the school, doesn't it? That, yeah. that, that actually... Uh, we don't all start work at eight o'clock and finish work at three o'clock. That isn't that isn't the culture of the school. It's not the way we're going to be. For some people, that might be appropriate. It might be helpful. But for others, we're going to be flexible to enable them to do the bits in their life that they need to do at various times in their lives, too. And I imagine, you know, I run a charity. I, I, I can offer certain arrangements to some people and I can't offer them to other people because their particular job it isn't a job that can be cut in this way or made part time or able to work those particular hours. So I've got policies that apply to everybody in terms of these are core hours and you work yeah. these and then you get this and then people can apply for a flexible working arrangement. That doesn't mean I can guarantee I can give it to them. Um, I don't think I've offended Pepe. I don't think that's why he's left the room. I think he's probably just lost his internet connection. Um, we cannot guarantee that we can deliver those to people. And I think Pepe would say that if he was here but we can guarantee to have the conversation and to be as creative as we can in finding a solution for people. Um, and I think that's what's at the, at, at the heart of all of this. Uh, I know that Steph is chomping at the bit to come and talk to you about teacher engagement. So let me just quickly uh, pick off the last couple of quick answers I can. 
um, to the questions that are there. The public first research on pupil attendance is very depressing. It's also really important as a school governor to read uh, and understand what's going on behind this because it's not this, these are not the same issues. I know you'll all know this. These are not the same issues that we were seeing four or five years ago as governors. Uh, and, and it's really important to understand, I think, the change that's happened to our, our children and young people. Um, uh, great to see a shout out for Australia. I think I think sabbaticals are a great thing and uh, I don't think we can afford them in our current public uh, fiscal constraint, but I do think sabbaticals offer a huge learning opportunity. Um, in terms of de demonstrating support and care, I think that point about workload and how we engage really matters. And then just asking the human question when you do encounter people of how are they and waiting long enough to really hear. Uh, I think this is the stuff that we know to do in our daily lives, but sometimes being a governor, it's a bit like this presentation, it's very rushed, we've got a lot to get through. So trying to just take a breath and find time for a cup of tea around a meeting, that kind of thing can make all the difference in the world. Um, I'm going to uh, give you the last word, Pepe, on a question that came in about uh, how long should people stay in role as a chair or a deputy chair? Um, and, uh, you know, obviously there's some real benefits to having people for a long time. And then there can also be some problems with that. What's optimum in your worldview? Um, I, I think that uh, heads need consistency at certain times in the school and the school needs consistency. And so to answer that question, I would say it depends on the context of the school, depends on the context of the governing body. But I, I would argue that if you've been doing the role for more than eight years, that there perhaps needs. I think he was going to say there perhaps needs to be a change. Uh, and I think he would be right. I think that's probably a good amount of time. Um, folks, I'm going to stop there. Uh, it's been really lovely having this conversation. I think you can tell we could go on all day and your questions have been super. Um, but I'm going to hand over to the splendid Steph Hamilton who is, uh, apart from being generally working for a fantastic organization called Impact Ed, who are trying to really help us all focus on what makes the most impact, Steph is also working on a very exciting uh, piece around teacher engagement and how we can track this. So I'm going to, Steph, hand over to you to tell everybody about it. Thanks so much, Sinead, and a uh, massive thank you to, to Governors for Schools for, for inviting me along uh, as well. And I think hopefully what I'll take you through over the next 15 minutes is um, some practical ways in which you can engage with your leadership teams and thinking about how do we understand what's happening in schools and how can we question um, what's going on, uh, what data should we use and what should you know you be, be paying attention to and I think Sinead kind of said it at the beginning you know um, teachers love teaching um, and my background I started my career as a as a science teacher um, and three years into teaching I became one of those statistics that left the profession and joined a joined the brilliant club of another kind of fabulous organization um, but I was one of those statistics and I think it's so great to see so many people caring really deeply about what can we do to keep really good uh, talent within the profession um, and, and try and make sure that it is sustainable. So hopefully, hopefully I can run you through what we're doing to address that um, and very happy to answer any questions and follow up with with anybody afterwards as well. So share my screen. So I am I have set up um, TEP or the engagement platform for schools and teachers. Um, and this is part of the Impact Ed group um, where we also evaluate what's happening in pupil interventions, um, understand what's going on with parents, and then also kind of governors is also something that, that we can evaluate as well. Um, but TEP is really focused on creating a specialist uh, platform to really understand what is an incredibly unique uh, working environment and making sure that, that we are equipped with the best data possible and that leaders have the best data possible in order to support their teams. Um, I'll take you through kind of briefly what TEP is and how we think it's going to support kind of the current sort of retention crisis and hopefully uh, help us weather the storm a little bit um, better. Um, 
I'm going to go through how TEP data is collected because we think that the methods of how we do this are as important as the, the data that we get out of it if we, we're going to make this a sustainable uh, data source for leaders. Um, and then I'll take you through some very brief pilot insights and, and kind of what we've learned about that and, and kind of what we can apply to retention in schools. The TEP was kind of set up to really help schools improve pupil outcomes and build sustainable working cultures. And we do this by enabling schools to easily understand, compare and take action on, on staff, uh, school staff engagement data. Um, and that sustainability is something that is incredibly important um, to me. And I think we have there's, there's been incredible innovation in the school sector in the last 10 years. But what we what we often have is um, kind of and, and Sinead again was, was talking about this, the amount of pressures on schools and teachers to do education, plus lots of other services to support young people and families um, is huge and it's not sustainable um, for us to continue this way. And, and we're really wanting to, to make sure that through collecting this data and understanding what works and what doesn't work, um, we can really move move sustainability kind of uh, to the forefront of how we, we kind of think about working cultures in schools. TEP's been on a bit of a journey over the last two years. So we really began with a research phase, maybe yeah, two years ago now, looking at what the evidence base is out there about teacher engagement and the link to pupil outcomes but also what is happening in other sectors as well. So other sectors, and I'm sure you are all from many different sectors outside of education as governors, um, and may have engaged with employee engagement sort of services within your own uh, organisations. There is lots and lots of best practice out there of, of what we can do to understand our workforces and their relationship to the organisations they work to. So what can we bring from those sectors and translate that into our sector and, and personalise it? So we've then been piloting our method, uh, our methods over the last 18 months. Um, so we've got over 7000 teacher responses and we've really been co-developing the, the methodology with school leaders. And we are going to go through some of the insights from that pilot. We're just launching into our foundation phase. So we're launching a digital platform to do the heavy lifting and make it as easy to use as possible. And really working with foundation partners to build the largest data set on st school staff engagement that there is uh, of this kind. And think about how we can disseminate actionable findings from that data. So what works? How can we share that? How can we, we kind of make sure that our decision making is as data led as possible? And as we get into um, the new year in 2024, we're going to be starting to match uh, engagement data to pupil outcomes data and looking at retention patterns in schools. So what flags can we see early? What data can we use to maybe predict retention challenges coming up? Um, so, you know, there are lots to engage with, whether your school is engaging with TEP and collecting this data. Um, you can definitely use some of this data to, to kind of help inform the questions that, that you're wanting to ask and understand what's happening within the staff body. But also we are going to be releasing lots of research and there will be events and blogs and papers that you can engage with as well um, that can just help build your understanding of, of what good is, good staff engagement looks like. And we know from the research that if there is a pipeline from having good staff engagement to improving those pupil outcomes and in between we, we can we know that we can build sustainability if we reduce burnout and if we can try and improve job satisfaction and, and a lot of what Sinead was, was referring to really backs this up as well. Um, and a lot of the, the research that's out there is maybe based in the US or other very small studies. So we're really wanting the TEP database to really contribute to um, the research that's out there and, and improve our understanding. The first paper that we are releasing is coming in October, and this is looking at the link between uh, teacher buy-in to the strategy of the school um, and the kind of le effective leadership behind that and then overall commitment to that organisation going forwards, which is going to be really important for retention. Um, so we've got an event on the 11th, which I'll make sure there's a link that you can that you can come to, but you're very welcome to hear about that research and kind of understand what we're learning in a little bit more detail and whether this is going to be something that's going to help us longer term. 
So I'm going to briefly run through how our data is collected and if your school work was kind of using it, what kind of questions can you ask and what might you understand through it? So the way that we developed TEP was to form a standardised question set and a uh, kind of census collection window uh, schedule that we run through the year. Uh, we create really strong benchmarks out of this um, and I'll kind of go through what we what we do with that. Our standardised question sets uh, kind of covers two things. So it looks at overall engagement. So if you were looking at a report for your school, uh, you could have a look at this headline engagement figure um, and look at how this changes over the course of the year. And if it's starting to dip, that might be a good time to kind of dig into the data a little bit more and ask some questions. Or we can kind of obviously see strategies and interventions kind of helping to, to kind of bring up that engagement uh, number overall. But we look at working environment, educational quality, allegiance, and then overall satisfaction, and we create a score out of that. From the research um, and from the pilot data, we have developed 10 engagement drivers that if we can improve the scores in these will overall influence engagement. We've made sure they're as broad as possible. So really looking, um, you know, not just at well-being or workload in isolation, but really making sure we can build the whole picture of things that are happening in school so that we can direct action because so many of these things are interlinked. Um, and obviously, you know, this was again mentioned earlier, but if behavior is an issue in school, this can directly affect well-being. So if your well-being score is low and behavior score is low, there is a kind of clear uh, avenue for action for, for leaders. So we think it's really important to ask these very holistically. And we are kind of really wanting to move away from a kind of finalised end of year survey, which is a lot of kind of what schools currently do. Um, and there really is really difficult to administer a whole school get kind of school feedback uh, system. So uh, what we are supporting schools to do and what the platform will help them to do is collect kind of data in windows all the way through the year. So you'll go, you've got live information. Um, that you can use to feed into leadership team meetings. There's reports that can be kind of shared with governors at a kind of regular intervals through the year. And TEP will support those leaders to reflect, share and act on some of that data as we go. I'm going to have to ignore it. The light keeps, uh, keeps going off in here. Um, and from that, we create really solid benchmarks and the benchmarks are a really important uh, kind of part of TEP so that we can make sure that um, there's some good comparison points and you know how much to care about different um, scores. So I'll kind of run you through how um, that is, is kind of going to be helpful. So we've got, I'm going to take you through two questions and some pilot data that, that we have used. So the first question is, I have an acceptable workload. This school scored 5.8 out of 10 compared to their school average of 7.6 out of 10. This was their lowest score in question. And that leadership team might have ploughed all of their time and energy into trying to reduce workload as the highest priority. We've got a second question of my manager cares about me as a person. Um, this question scored 7.7 .7 out of 10 compared to their school average of 7.6. This is one of their highest scoring questions and they could kind of well assume that they're doing kind of really well for line management practice. But because we ask all the questions at the same time and in that census window, we can create really solid benchmarks to understand where these scores lie against everybody else at the same time. Um, so if we were applying the benchmarks here, the workload question actually puts them 1.7 above the national benchmark and in the upper 50% of schools. And the managerial question puts them in the bottom 25% of schools and is 1.2 below. And this is really the, the kind of comparison point that is going to be really useful for them to direct their action. Because we know that people answer a workload question really differently from how they might answer a question about a manager, a person that, that they know. A 10 out of 10 score is much more likely for, for that sort of question compared to workload. And when leaders have a million things on their plate that they need to do, it's really, really important that they can narrow down the areas where they can shift the dial and where they can have the biggest effect. 
So this school is probably already doing a lot and doing, you know, this leadership team is probably doing a lot to try and mitigate some of the workload challenges within the resourcing and within the wider environment that we've got. But actually, they could really have a big impact on staff engagement if they work on some of the line manager practices and, and kind of drill down into those. So what the reporting can show schools over time, especially if we do it all the way through the year, is that they might be able to identify that the score has dipped since autumn. So can already kind of trigger what's what's been happening. Is there any particular emerging issues uh, that have happened over this period of time? They could see that it's pushed down in humanities and they could see that it's pushed down in particular with early career staff. So we can really help leaders direct this to some sustainable practice in schools and direct some of their action. So in schools, they can maybe put some proactive support in place for early career teachers. If they're working in groups, so if they're within a trust or a kind of a local network, they can have a real shared language for teacher engagement and identify schools that are kind of performing above benchmarks in certain areas so can share some of that practice um, and identify schools that are doing kind of not as well compared to benchmarks and reach out for support and kind of get some of that context. And then in the wider tech community, so all the schools that are taking part get access to case studies and, and we are going to start to build a real bank of ideas about if you're performing low in a particular area, what you can do, and also signpost to services like education support um, that can really support uh, leaders with some of the actions they might need to take. Um, and the way that we have done the scoring, as well as kind of giving a breadth of understanding, is also really giving um, a range of different scoring methods. Um, so as well as sort of having uh, mean scores, they can have net scores and also look at the distribution so they can see how how far from from the average are they uh, at any given time. And so that's sort of the wider context of how we're collecting it. Um, and so if you are engaging with that, you've got kind of a reference point um, as to what your leaders might have access to. Um, and I'll give you a quick insight over what we've learned from the pilot so far, um, and then we can jump into some questions. So the pilot data was collected over four terms, um, last academic year and the, and the end of 2022. Um, and the key things that I'll bring out here are that leadership and management engagement drivers are most strongly correlated with overall engagement um, and that workload scores are consistently the lowest, but there are some schools bucking the trend. And I think this is really useful for us to think about, well, what can be done? Where can we have an effect and where is it possible to take action when we are as under resourced as we as we currently are? Um, and I'll also make sure this is shared afterwards, but there is a blog that goes into the leadership um, kind of engage leadership impact uh, on an overall staff engagement on the Impact Ed website. So you can look at this in a bit more detail. But what we can see here is our overall engagement score at the top and all of our engagement drivers. Um, and, and the higher this number is, is the like how closely correlated it is to overall engagement and what we can see is leadership and management drivers teacher well-being growth development and retention diversity and inclusion classroom behavior are the top drivers that can most affect overall engagement and this is quite encouraging because this means that a lot of the things that are within leaders control in terms of the culture and environment that they create in school um, are within their power to, to improve and to change. And what we were really surprised by is um, obviously things like recognition and reward um, is coming kind of mid table. So while every teacher kind of deserves to get the compensation that, that, that they need for the hard work that they do, um, and, that, and that can definitely be better funded. There are things that leaders can do to shift that dial whilst there are big external pressures and things that they might not be able to control. Um, and things uh, kind of like emotions towards teaching and attitudes towards teaching are least correlated. So what we're seeing uh, reflects what we already know is teachers love teaching. Um, and no matter what environment they're in, these are tending to score incredibly highly. So aren't as affected uh, by overall engagement. 
But I know from my own experience in schools, if I had a manager coming in and chatting to me and having a really positive effect on my day, that would massively boost engagement um, many, much more than a lot of the other factors on this list. So really making sure that leaders are well supported to be that positive presence in their team's lives is, is so crucial to, to creating overall good engagement. And the paper that that uh, we're releasing, John Jerram is going to go into this in a little bit more detail. Um, but this is breaking down some of those questions under the leadership and management um, category. So what we can see is strategy buy-in. So there's this question and and the ability to voice concerns. A question uh, that we ask within these categories are really highly correlated with overall engagement. And we see that the schools that have high engagement have a high ability to kind of get your team to, to buy in, but also to voice concerns as well. So that is kind of typical of high performing teams and, and kind of leaders that are doing really well. Um, and then where we get the lowest engagement is where this is a little bit more erratic. And there are some schools that kind of buck the trend in various ways. Um, but what we are encouraged by is if we can really think about the, the sort of getting things in place for leadership teams that means that these two things happen, we have a good chance of improving overall engagement. And finally, workload scores consistently uh, low from the pilots, but we do see that schools are bucking the trend. And we see the biggest variety of scores with workloads. So this question here, I pay a lot of attention to how I teach, is one of our attitudes towards teaching que teaching questions. There's not much variety. Teachers love teaching. There's They're kind of all scoring fairly highly on this. But what we can see here is while the average is 5.5 um, and quite low, we've got some schools really bucking the trend. So what TEP data is going to allow us to do is really I go in and identify, well, what's happening in these schools that are bucking the trend? What can we learn from them? And what I'm really excited by, and it goes back to maybe what Pepe was talking about with flexible working, um, there's lots of new innovations that we need to try. And uh, it's really tricky for leaders to kind of stick their neck out and try some new strategies. Um, and what we really hope is that they can try these new strategies and see what's happening in the data to give them that confidence to be more bold with the with the strategies they're using to keep their teams going. And we're really looking forward to kind of building this database and providing um, sort of more information that people can use to, to make those decisions. Um, I'm going to pause there because I'm really keen that we can get to some questions. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing and open open up the chat. And I'm sure there might be more for Sinead as well. Um, da -da. So I can see from Kirsty, John, are you asking for more schools and staff to take uh, to take part? Um, really useful. Yes. Um, wave at this again. Um, it would be really useful. Uh, you know, the data is better uh, the more and more schools that we have on board. Within the pilot, we were being really careful and making sure that we were getting it right. Um, and now we're really confident that we've got a good method out there and that the platform is going to be ready to support as many schools as we can. Um, so if this is something that you want to uh, chat to your teams about, um, do put them in my direction and I'm really happy to get them set up. Do, do, do. How much does it cost? Um, that's that's always a key question. This varies depending on the school size. So we're really wanting to make sure it's affordable for schools and sustainable um, so that it could be some data that's easy to run and, and use in the background. So um, it, it kind of ranges depending on school size, but it's all under £2,000. And for primary schools and small schools, it's all under £1,000, but it kind of grade, grades up um, that we can use. Um, does the questionnaire cover and isolate the state impact of relationships between central tr trust and individual schools? Um, so what um, we can do is we can give uh, kind of different levels of visibility of the data. So we can, you know, for a trust, we would set up all of the schools to have their own data and engage with that as usual. But we can also create a group view um, and, and a kind of produce kind of more bespoke research reports for trusts and mats so that you can look at particular themes that go across and we can also uh, put some custom questions in so if there's a particular uh, interest in understanding some dynamics with the central trust compared to individual organizations within that trust that's something that we can explore in a bit more detail as well um, and Bruce, do we do we differentiate between primaries and secondaries? Um, so this is really very interesting. So um, the kind of 
data that I kind of briefly showed you was for everybody, but as soon as we start getting into to the detail, um, we can start to see that primaries are ever so slightly more engaged than secondaries. Um, and there are some kind of subtle differences in the drivers for engagement um, that we can see are kind of more performing better in primaries compared to secondaries and then vice versa. So we'll be releasing um, more of this data over the coming term. So please, please keep posted. Um, and equally, if schools can look at compare their own data to a national benchmark, but then also to primary special school benchmark, um, kind of whichever is going to be most useful for them as well. And then doo -doo, I think the other two questions might be more for, um, for Sinead. Um, so I don't know, Sinead, whether you want to pick those, those last two up or if there are any other questions um, that anyone has about the TEP data um, or anything else that we've covered today. I think just quickly on on sabbaticals. Yes, we think they're brilliant. We don't think they're affordable though. Um, so sadly, uh, difficult to implement. And I think on the demonstrating supporting care, I think refers to governors supporting leaders. I think we did cover that with Pepe. So I won't repeat that, Olivia. 